A fiery horse with a speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver. The Lone Ranger. Faithful Indian companion Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. One Silver. Let's go, big fella. Dan Reed, teenage nephew of the Lone Ranger, was returning to join his friends after a visit some distance away. He sat in the passenger car of the train next to a man who wore a short beard and side whiskers. No words were spoken between the two until the train approached Rockville, Dan's destination. Then the man stood and reached to take his baggage from the rack overhead. A small black bag fell to the floor beside Dan. I'll pick up your things, sir. Let him alone. I'll pick them up. I'm sorry. I was just trying to help. Forget it. He must be a doctor. No. No, I'm not. I, I am a salesman. I sell medical instruments. Oh, I think I found everything. I, I didn't mean to be sharp with you, son. Oh, that's all right. Are you going to Rockville? Yes, sir. You live there? I'm staying near there for a while with friends. But you are familiar with the town. Oh, yes, sir. Is there a good boarding house there? Well, there's several. Mrs. Jackson's is the best, I think. Good. Thanks. Oh, for Rockville. Rockville, next door. Do you think you could take the time to show me the way to the Jackson place? Oh, it's easy to find, sir. The last house up Main Street from the station on the left. Thanks, sir. Goodbye. Bye, sir. Then we'd left the train and met Tonto, who waited nearby with the horses. Hello, Tonto. Oh, Dan. It's good to have you back. You have nice time? Yes, but I'm glad to be back, too. I miss Victor especially. And Victor miss you. We leave now. Go to camp. Easy, Scout. Easy, Scout. Get, eh? Get him up, Scout. Come on, Victor. Dan and Tonto soon arrived at the camp in the hills where the Lone Ranger was waiting. Oh, Victor, hold on. Steady, boy. Easy, well, Dan, it's good to have you back. Did you enjoy your short stay with Clarabelle Hornblower? <laughs> Yes, sir. Thunder Martin spent most every evening there. And the way he and Clarabelle talked to each other, you'd think they were about to come to blows. <laughs> Clarabelle and Thunder are the best of friends. They have to be known to be appreciated. <laughs> That's right. 
Did you see anyone on the train you knew, Dan? No, sir. I sat with a man who was going to Rockville. He wasn't very friendly. Well, some people don't take well to strangers, Dan. But I didn't try to talk to him. Oh. He dropped a small black bag and the instruments and it spilled. Well, I started to pick them up and he told me to let them alone. I was only trying to help. I'm sure you were. You uh, mentioned instruments. Well, that's right, sir. The kind doctors use. Oh, he's a doctor then? Well, that's what I thought. But when I asked him, he said he was a salesman. That he sells medical instruments. A salesman of medical instruments would never make a living here in the far west, Dan. Doctors are few and far between. And those who have come out here have come prepared to practice. Isn't that right? But that's what he told me. Well, perhaps he resented you asking questions. Maybe. He apologized right after. You say he left the train at Rockville? Yes, sir. The only doctor there is old Dr. Cushing. In fact, he's the only doctor within a hundred miles of here. Ah. Fellow not get rich selling Doc Cushing instruments. I'm sure that Dan's traveling companion is here for some other purpose, Tonto. I wonder why he told me that. I wonder too, Dan. <laughs> The Lone Ranger and Toto stopped in the neighborhood of Rockville for two weeks to rest the horses and to repair worn riding gear. During that time, Dan Reed took another trip to visit old friends. Two days after Dan's return, he went to the general store in Rockville for supplies. Oh, oh, Victor, oh, oh, oh. Oh, I think I can manage. Well, let me help, ma'am. Well, now that's right nice of you, son. Here, you carry the bag of sugar. All right. There, you're a mighty polite boy. Uh, follow me. The buggy's right over there. Yes, sir. This is it. <laughs> oh, now, Jenny, be patient. <laughs> That mare, Jenny, hates to wait a minute. There. Put that bag in front, son. All right. Oh, thanks for the help. What's your name? Dan Reed. I'm Mrs. Jackson. I own the boarding house at the end of Main Street. Yes, I know. I sent you a boarder. A man I met on the train. Let me see. Oh, yes. He must be the tall, slim man with the short beard and whiskers. Uh, Mr. Bob Thorne. Oh, I don't know his name, but the description fits him. It was nice of you to send him, Dan. But, well, he's a strange one. Though he does pay promptly and well. I don't know much about him. He asked about a place to stay, and I told him about your place. You know, Dan, outside of the time he came to ask for a room, I really haven't set eyes on him. He never leaves his room. What about his meals? He paid me to have his meals sent to him in his room. Pays for everything in advance, but stays away from everyone. Gosh, that's strange. That's just what I say. It's very strange. Of course, it's not up to me to question my rumors as long as they pay up and behave themselves. Oh, I suppose not. He asked for the best room in the house, so I gave him the back room on the ground floor. Charged him plenty but he paid without arguing. Uh, well, thanks for helping me, Dan. I'll be getting back. It'll soon be time to feed a lot of hungry boarders. Goodbye, son. Bye, Mrs. Jackson. Get up there. Get up. Dan Reed went back into the store and bought his supplies. When he returned to camp, he found the Lone Ranger and Tonto studying several handbills the Indian brought from town earlier that day. Dan told of his conversation with Mrs. Jackson. When he finished, the Lone Ranger remarked, That stranger at the Jackson boarding house interests me, Dan. He must have some reason for avoiding people. That's right. Even Mrs. Jackson thinks he acts strangely. She said his name is Bob Thorne. That's right, sir. Give me those handbills, Tonto, please. Uh -huh. yeah. I remember one of these. Oh, let's see. Oh, here it is. What does it say? Listen. Wanted for murder, Dr. Thornton Roberts, 35, tall, slim, clean-shaven, dark hair. Notify United States Marshal St. Louis. You think fellow named Thorn wanted for murder, Kimasabi? It's possible, Tonto. This handbill is two months old. He could have grown a short beard and whiskers in that time. Also, there's a similarity in the names. Thornton Roberts, Bob Thorn. Gosh. 
He was carrying medical instruments, too. That's right, Dan. He was upset because you saw them. Oh. And what you do? First, I'll telegraph the marshal in St. Louis and get more details. Then I'll try to prove that the man in town is Dr. Thornton Roberts. <laughs> After the Lone Ranger prepared a message, Tonto took it to the telegraph office in Rockville and had it sent to the United States Marshal in St. Louis. Uh, how soon you get answer? I can't tell you, Indian. That message has to be relayed to St. Louis. It might be hours before the answer comes through. Uh, well, me come back later. Well, don't make it too soon. No telling how long it'll take. Come back after supper. Uh-huh. Meantime, Dan Reed, who had ridden to town with Tonto, waited at the hitch rack outside the telegraph office. Dan saw a horseman galloping into town. The man drew rein when he saw Dan. Oh, oh, hey, oh. hey, son, where will I find Doc Cushing? Third house on the right beyond the hotel. What happened, mister? Some kind of epidemic broke out over Milton. It's getting worse, and there isn't any doctor there. I sure hope Doc Cushing's at his office. Get away, go! Oh. Who? Who fella just leave, Dan? He's from Milton. Asked me where to find Dr. Cushing. Uh, why him want doctor? Uh, he says there's an epidemic in Milton and they have no doctor there. Oh, that's not good. We go tell Lone Ranger. He's <laughs> got easy for that. Get him off. Come, Come on, Victor. A short time later, Dan and Tonto arrived at the camp where the Lone Ranger was waiting. Won't come, Mr. Fellow. Easy, Mr. Fellow. We'll see to be in a hurry. Is there something wrong? A man came to town from Milton looking for Dr. Cushing. He says there's an epidemic over there. Isn't that right? What kind of an epidemic? He didn't say, sir. We'll ride to town and try to find out more about it. Did you send the telegram, Tonto? Uh huh. The fellow say it take a long time to get answer. It's sundown now. It will be dark by the time we reach town. We'll get news of the epidemic in Milton. Before long, I hope to know for certain if that fellow Bob Thorne is a doctor who's wanted for murder in St. Louis. All right, let's go. The Lone Ranger, Tonto, and Dan rode to the outskirts of Rockville and stopped in a clump of cottonwoods. Oh, 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 oh. Dan, you go to the telegraph office and wait there for the answer to the telegram Tonto sent. Yes, sir. Tonto, I want you to go into town and try to find out more about that epidemic. I'll wait here until you come back. Ah, come, Dan. Get him up. Come, come on, Victor. A short time later, Tonto returned and told the Lone Ranger that Dr. Cushing had gone to Milton a small town four miles away. Otherwise, there was no further news about the epidemic. The Lone Ranger decided that he and Tonto would wait until Dan returned with the answer to the telegram. It was two hours later when Dan finally came back to the Cottonwood Grove. Oh, oh, Victor, hold on, hold, hold, steady, boy, steady. Did you bring the answer, Dan? No, sir, it hasn't come through yet. Why did you come back? I thought I ought to tell you something that happened. While I was waiting at the telegraph office, Mrs. Jackson, the lady who owns a boarding house, came in. Where could you telegraph to reach another doctor? The nearest doctor outside of Dr. Cushing is in Austin, oh, 100 miles away. Oh. Well, what's it all about, Miss Jackson? Can't you find Dr. Cushing? He drove to Milton several hours ago. Just sent a man from there to my house asking me to come over to help. There's an epidemic of diphtheria in Milton. Seems it's mighty bad. I thought if you could reach another doctor, they... Oh, but never mind. Dr. Cushing and I'll do what we can. Diphtheria, huh? See, yeah. that is bad. I'll telegraph to Austin, but even if the doctor's there, it'll take him some time to drive a hundred miles. Thank you. I'll be on my way to Milton now. There's no time to lose. I thought you ought to know, so I came right over to tell you. I'm glad you did. Go back and wait at the telegraph office, Dan. Meanwhile, Tonto and I'll see what we can do to help. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
Now to continue. A short time later, the man Dan had met on the train, Bob Thorne, sat on the edge of the bed with his head in his hands. Suddenly, he looked up, startled, as he heard a thud near the window behind him. What? Now, don't go. You're covered. A masked man. What do you want? I came to talk to you, Thorne. I want straight answers. I have no reason to talk to a man wearing a mask. Forget the mask. Uh, Dr. Thornton Roberts is wanted for murder in St. Louis. What's that got to do with me? If you were clean-shaven, you'd match his description, Thorne. No, you... You can't say I'm Roberts. You have no proof. You carry a medical kit. That means nothing. Nothing, I tell you. No? You're not very convincing, Thorne. Even the way you change your name gives you away. Thornton Roberts changed to Bob Thorne. Oh. Why have you come here? I've done nothing wrong, no matter what you or anyone else says. Uh, you're an outlaw, so I'll admit I'm Dr. Roberts. But I didn't commit murder. I shot in self-defense. And they don't believe it. I'm inclined to believe you, Thorne. What? Have you heard of the epidemic in Milton four miles from here? Yes, Mrs. Jackson told me. They need help desperately. I don't dare go. The law would pick me up. You took an oath to help mankind, Doctor. Regardless of the outcome to you, don't you think you should keep that oath and go offer your services? I... I don't know. I don't know. It may mean saving many lives. Think that over. I can't decide now. I must think. All right. Think about it. I'll wait for you in the clump of cottonwoods on the south edge of town. If you decide to go to Milton, I'll ride with you. Remember your oath, Doctor. And remember that many lives depend on your decision. I'll be waiting, and I'll have a horse for you. Adios. The Lone Ranger and Tonto waited a short time at the edge of town. Tonto had procured another horse at the livery stable. The two men sat in silence on Silver and Scout for some time. Then Tonto spoke. Well, it, it looked like him not come, Kimosabe. Maybe you're right, Tonto. I may have misjudged him. You really think him... Kimosabe, me here, footsteps now. That must be Thorn. Oh, that's plenty good. Well, you win, mister. Here I am. Good. We brought this horse for you. You see, you realize I'm practically riding to the gallows. I admire your great courage. All right, let's go. Come on, Silver. Get him up. Oh. Get up. In the meeting house at Milton, Dr. Cushing worked unceasingly over the many sufferers who had been brought into the place. At his side was Mrs. Jackson. Both were exhausted with their continued efforts to stem the epidemic, which seemed to be growing worse. Uh, Mrs. Jackson, I, I'm fighting to stay on my feet. I know, Doctor. If only we could help another doctor. But there's none to be had. My medicine is running low, too. Oh, my. When that's gone, it'll be pretty bad. Pretty bad. I... I... I Get me to, to a cot, quick. Well, heaven help us, you've got it yourself. Let me help you to that cot over there. <laughs> Can't let it get me. I gotta keep going. I gotta... <coughs> Doctor, whatever are we gonna do now? <laughs> Meanwhile, in the cafe in Milton, a subdued group of men stood around talking. It's getting worse, that's what. Had several deaths already. Yeah, Doc Cushing can't handle them alone. We can't find another doctor we can get to come here. We ought to get our families out of here. Can't do that. Sheriff's orders. Uh, here comes Sheriff now. Howdy, boys. Howdy, Sheriff. Things getting any better, Sheriff? We can't stay here and die like rats. I'm sorry, but I can't allow anyone to leave town. You'd just be taking the epidemic somewhere else. Maybe Doc Cushing will be able to... Sir! Doc Cushing's down what? sick. Huh? Oh, all they smoke, we'll all get it now. Well, what are we going to do? Uh, hold on, all of you. Looks mighty bad, I know, but 
We'll have to do the best we can till we can find another doctor. There isn't another doctor within a hundred miles. That's sure. right, Sheriff, and he can't leave. He's sending medicine, but he can't come. We just got word. Hey, look. I saw through the door. A masked man just stopped outside. Yeah. All right, stay here, all of you. I'll go out. <laughs> Sheriff, I'm looking for you. This letter will identify me. Let me see. Signed by the governor. It says you're the Lone Ranger. That's right. Well, I'm mighty glad to see you, my friend. But things are mighty bad here, let me tell you. Doc Cushing's been stricken, too. Oh, that's bad. Sheriff, I brought another doctor. Oh, this man here. Another doctor? But there isn't any to be had. Only Doc Meeks, and he's a hundred miles away. I'm a doctor, Sheriff. Then you're the best news we've had today. You better get over the meeting house right away, Doc, and hurry. All right, Sheriff. Come on, Sheriff. Get up there. Arriving at the meeting house, the Lone Ranger and Tonto went inside with the young doctor. They approached Mrs. Jackson. Mrs. Jackson, I brought another doctor. Oh, thank heaven. We... A masked man and a Mr. Thorne. The masked man is a friend to all of us. As for me, I'm Dr. Thornton Roberts. I'm ready to go to work. Dr. Thornton Roberts? But I thought... No you time were... for explanations now. They can come later. Yes, they'll come later. Now we have serious work to do. Meanwhile, back in Rockville, Dan Reed waited for an answer to the telegram Tonto had sent. He made several visits to the telegraph office without result. The last time he went there, the operator had news for him. Well, son, I see you're back again. Yes, sir. That message I'm waiting for is very important. Well, I have news for you, and it's not good. What do you mean? I got word the lines are out of order. Somewhere between here and St. Louis. Oh, then you can't receive any messages from the East. That's right. I'm sorry, son. Kelly, how long do you think it'll be before the line will open up again? Yeah, no telling. Lines will have to be sent out to find the trouble. It may take a few hours, and then again it may take a couple of days. Oh, golly. Yeah, there's nothing I can do about it, son. The only thing I can suggest is that you keep coming back here till the lines are working and that message comes. All right, sir. I'll wait at the hotel. At the hotel, eh? Well, I'll tell you what. If they get the lines working the message comes in, I'll bring it over to you. Well, thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye, son. Several days passed. Young Dr. Roberts, with the Lone Ranger and Mrs. Jackson, constantly at his side, worked without let-up. He knew his business thoroughly and brought hope and confidence to the whole town. It was almost noon of the third day when he and the Lone Ranger stood with Mrs. Jackson outside the meeting house door. Well, I think we've got this under control. There haven't been any new cases brought in. You certainly know your business, Doctor. Oh, he's wonderful. Doc Cushing is feeling better, too. And we haven't had a death since Dr. Roberts started working on them. Oh, oh, here comes the sheriff. Boy, everybody's talking about what the new doc's done here. <laughs> That's right. It's sure like a miracle the way you stepped in and practically stopped this epidemic. Fortunately, I made a special study of this disease. Also, I had a goodly quantity of medicine with me. It was fortunate you came to Rockville. Look, uh... We come over after having a meeting in the cafe. We voted to ask you, Doc, to stay here for keeps. We'll give you a house to live in. It would be a wonderful thing for this town if the doctor will accept. But I... And look, why haven't you told the sheriff what you know about me? I did, Doctor. You you did? (laughs) Sure he did. Right after a boy came over from Rockville early this morning with a telegram from St. Louis. And that's the answer to your offer for me to stay here. I'll be going back to St. Louis. Maybe the sheriff has more to say, Doctor. I sure have. That telegram says you're not wanted there at all. What? You were exonerated by witnesses after that handbill was sent out. I, I don't know what to say. Doctor, I realized you were the man listed on a handbill I received. When I faced you in your room and reminded you of your doctor's oath, I felt that if you were really guilty of murder, the oath would mean nothing to you. The frenzied husband of a woman patient who died came gunning for me. I, 
I had to shoot in self-defense. When you promised Toto and me to come here to help, I knew you couldn't have committed deliberate murder. You lived up to your oath, though it might have meant you'd be facing a murder charge. What is all this? Now, don't worry, Mrs. Jackson. Dr. Roberts is free to stay here if he chooses. After I talked to him, he could have tried to escape. Instead, he decided to come here and take the consequences. I admire his courage. Yep, we all do, mister. We'll be proud to have him for our town doctor. Thank you. I'm happy and proud to accept you. Hello, Dan is waiting for us at the edge of town. Dr. Roberts has everything well in hand here now. Adios, doctor. Goodbye, all. Goodbye. 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 He's a wonderful and remarkable man, Sheriff. If it hadn't been for him, I might have been a fugitive from justice the rest of my life. I'll never forget the Lone Ranger. This is a feature of The Lone Ranger Incorporated, created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of The Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Brace Beamer.